Um, the title of my talk is How to Write Well-Designed Imports with Symphony. Um, whether they're that well-designed, we can discuss in the afterwards, um, but it's something that at least works for me. But before I go, let's maybe introduce myself properly. Um, my name is Dennis Brumann. I work at Sensor Labs in Germany. And we have locations in Hamburg, actually, in, in Berlin, and in Cologne. That's our main location. And I'm one of the Berlin developers. And what we do is we offer services around Symfony and, and PHP in general. Uh, that basically means we are doing trainings, we are doing uh, consulting, and we also basically hands-on developer assistance in, in projects. So in my case, I usually go into migration projects. That means um, it's a legacy system of ki some kind. It can be two years old. I think the oldest I had was 15 years old. And then we want to get some improvement in terms of stability, code quality, stuff like that, and, and basically make sure that, that we can still deliver features in that project. And as part of that work, I, I kind of try to figure out, like, is this something that other people might be interested? And I stumbled upon uh, the, the batch processing in a few of my last projects where I noticed that they're an integral part of the, the business uh, domain basically in, in those projects, but it was something that was built on the site, just ran, and everything was fine until the business changed and, and those imports didn't work anymore. And then it was very apparent that those are business critical because other teams couldn't work and those imports had to be finished by 6.30 in the morning. And Developers usually tend to show up at 9 or 10-ish, which is kind of an issue. Um, yeah, so, so I figured, yeah, may maybe this is something I should look into and, and maybe um, I should give my insights to other people. And this is what I'm here for. To be quite honest, most of the stuff I will tell you is, is basically not my idea. It's, it's something that, that I took from the Java specification request 352 batch applications for the Java platform. And this is a 120-something page-long guide that, that basically defines how you can write batch programs in a certain way that, that is basically reusable and, and you can basically use it to write kind of a batch processing library. And that's what the Java folks did. They have the Spring Batch component. And yeah, so, so I basically took inspiration from that. It's not a exact implementation of that, but I, I will show some things where basically um, I, I can show you that this is an inspiration that I got. And when I say I, I want to show you well-designed imports, I figured I, I should actually tell you what well-designed in my case means, because for you there might be different criteria. On the left-hand side, you see very code-specific things, like I want the code that I write to be testable, preferably unit-testable. Um, if not, then at least I want to write functional tests for it. Um, I want it to be modifiable in two senses. Thanks for closing the door. That's actually way better. <laughs> uh, I want it to be modifiable um, in, in two senses in that I, I want code that, that is small enough that I can grasp it, that, that, that I can easily modify it should I have to. And I want it to be basically replaceable with some other code so that I can basically exchange classes and, and things will still work. And something ties into that, and that is the reusability. I want most of those classes that are right to be reusable in other projects. So I basically want to have a kind of generalized solution, and I want to minimize the space where I have the project-specific code. And since we're in a cinema, I figured I, I show something in an ex kind of example import, and I chose the IMDB public data sets. For those of you who don't know, IMDB has a set of like um, names date table, uh, sorry, and, and CSV files or TSV as they call it because it's tab separated for names of actors, animators, um, actresses, directors, basically all the stuff in a movie. And then they have a title uh, file where you can get all the movies, TV shows and episodes and everything. And you can pull those files f from their uh, page. They, uh, in, in terms of the names table, which I will use, um, it's 9.5 million records and, and a few more. 
And I think if you unzip it, it's roughly 500 MB file, so quite large. And this is basically what I took as, as, as my thing to write a baseline implementation against that we can see how we improve in terms of performance. And this is what this file looks like if you open it. Um, you have a title line that basically defines all the columns and then in there you have in the first column the, the kind of ID thing with a prefix nm for that is from the name. If you look at the very last column, you see the, the titles. Uh, basically, this is the, the movies and episodes and everything this person is known for. And again, you can see it's reference kind of ID thing. You have a primary name, you have birth year. The death year is, is kind of interesting because you can see this is not just an empty column. They, they have a placeholder slash n value there to tell you that it's kind of null. And you have this, this array kind of thing. So pretty much basic thing, and there's 9.5 million records of it. And yeah, so basically you want to process it. And if you think about batch processing and, and imports, at some point you will notice that there's a recurring theme that you have. Basically, all you want to do is first you want to read something in, then you want to process it in, in some kind of way. This can be mapping it to so that the input file matches more closely to your uh, entities or, or the, the tables or whatever you use. Or it can even be something more advanced that you enrich it with some API data, for example. And this is basically a processing part. And then at the very end, you want to write it to a database, to Elasticsearch, or whatever. And this is just one step of an import. This doesn't have to be a full import. In some cases, it actually is. But you can also imagine if you have, for example, the, the name file and the title file, and, and they reference each other, like we saw here, that you basically want the step where you read in the names, process them, write them maybe to an intermediary table, and then do the same for the titles. And then you have a third step where basically you read your names, and then you, you query the, the titles in the processing step, and write the final data, for example. So you, you have those three things, and, and you just um, try to use them as often as possible, as, as basically those are your steps that you will take in the import. And again, as I said, um, the JSR352 is, is kind of my inspiration for that. And I took the um, sequence diagram here to basically show you how they describe how you can actually implement a step in, in terms of what it should do. We start by executing the step itself. It will then call our item reader. So we have a, a separate class for just reading stuff. We get back an item. Th this is basically the row from our TSV file. This row is then passed to an item processor, which will process it in some way and, and return the processed item back. This can be in the same row if we stay basically in our IRS syntax because we want to uh, minimize the, the processing steps. Or it can also be our entity that basically we use from, from that. And then we don't just write it. We actually do this step a little while until a certain write interval is met. And then we will basically call write. And the, the reason for that is that if we just do read, process, write, then basically we would not be able in our writer to, to have something like transactions, for example, um, because that logic um, would require us to, to know more items. So it would basically seep into our step logic, which we want to minimize. We want to actually be a, keep the transaction and all the writing logic in our writer. So we actually have to pass in multiple files. So since it says code talks, this is a very code heavy talk. I, I will go to basically the example code and this is the step code that we just saw. Um, let's start with reading and writing. We initialize both our reader and our writer by opening them uh, with a context. This is basically so we can have a generic reader, for example, for CSV-like files or for flat files. And then we can pass in the additional info, like how, how is it formatted um, and wh where does the file live? And also stuff like where do I want to start reading from and when do I want to stop reading, for example. And the same for writing. I want to tell it what kind of entities I want to write, for example. So I basically have a mutator that, that gives me uh, the reader for, for the current thing I have. And, and we, I can reuse the same class all over again. And I don't have to initialize them right away with all those read context specific data. What's interesting is that our reader in, in PHP or my reader in PHP doesn't return an item. It actually returns a generator. 
Um, if you don't use them, they, they are a little bit intimidating at first, but, but super useful if you want to work memory efficient. And basically, it's um, a function that, that you can iterate over, and it gives you an item back every time you call it, and that, that is what we do. We call generator current to get the current item, pass it to the processor, do it a few times until we meet the right interval, and then we just write and we clear out the items that we stored in cache so we stay memory efficient. And then at the very end, after the loop, we just write again just in case we still have items that we didn't persist yet. So this is the gen generic step kind of thing. And this is the reader that I usually have, or the interface for it. As you already saw, there's an open and read function. The count function we don't have to care about. This is for partitioning, we see later. Um, and yeah, basically, the, the open function gives me a prepared instance of that reader. It, it can be the same instance where, where I basically have um, ki kind of stateful service, or I just get a new instance back that, that is initialized, um, however I like it. So this is what I usually de do on open. I clone my current reader, I set the SPL file object, which is an object-oriented way to, to process um, files, um, which I really like over just calling the fget CSV, for example, because then I would have this logic for setting CSV control and everything inside my read function, which I want to avoid. Uh, the whole flex is just to basically skip empty lines and, and basically declare that this is a CSV kind of file. Um, I could also set the CSV control as part of the context. I just didn't do it here because I was lazy. And yeah, so the important part in the read function is then that, as I said, it will return a generator. So basically, once I call the read method, I ju just get an object back that, that I can iterate over. And as soon as I get the current item, it will jump to the yield that you maybe see here. And it will give me something back that kind of looks like an array with an offset and an item in there. So from the outside world, it, lo it looks like I have a huge array with all my 9.5 million items. But in reality, I only read the, the line as soon as I call current, so that I stay memory efficient. And the line position, for example, for the file seek you see, and also the read limit, this is something that I set via the context. And this is basically just so I can um, reread a file from a certain point um, in case some import fails at, with just one item or at, at some point. I can basically restart it and don't have to read the whole file again. And just thinking back to, to our criteria that we had, I, I want to basically have it testable. And you can see that this is testable very easily. I just create my reader instance. I create my read context, which tells me which file I want to read. I open it. Um, by calling read, I get the generator back. And then I just iterate over it, collect the rows, and I can s check if the rows actually contain the data from my fixtures file that I have here, which is just three lines, the title, then two items, and in this case, I just check for the ID because that's enough. And I can also write a test where basically I set the offset, the, the line position to one, so I skip the title j just by using that offset. And I can also adjust the read context so I limit the rows, and, and basically I have all things covered. And I don't need any fancy dependencies or anything. It's, it's fairly straightforward to test it. So just to check back on, on our requirements that we uh, set out in the beginning, as you just saw, it's easily testable. It's kind of a short code. It's like 80 lines or something. And, and you, you can probably space it out a little bit to make it easier readable or, or compress it more. But during the, uh, using the interface allows us to replace it with any other kind of reader, for example, an XML kind of reader or something like that. And yeah, it's, it's reusable because it's just flat file reading. It's very straightforward. We can't really tell how fast it is. I mean, it's just reading stuff in. Probably it is kind of okay-ish. But it definitely is memory efficient because we use generators, for example, to, to not just read in the whole file. Um, Obviously, if you have other file formats, it might not be as easy. XML, for example, is, is not very easy to process. You can do it as well with a pull parser, for example, XML reader. So you can also read it line, well, not line by line, but element by element. But yeah, it should be straightforward. So I will rush over the next two files because they are not that interesting. The processor just takes the array that we got back, creates an entity from it, and yeah, it's testable. Just 
put in an array, get back an entity that, that's easy to test. I can replace it with any other processor that I want, depending on my needs. Obviously, the more complex my processing part is, the, the more I have to ensure that it's testable and everything. But it's pretty much uh, testable. The code itself is not reusable. Th this is where I store my project-specific code, basically, in the processors. So I'm fine that this kind of processor is basically tied to my current project, because they are, this is where I want to keep the code. As long as it's just in the processor, I'm fine with it. And with the writer, you basically see the same pattern that we saw before. Um, we loop over the items, and then once we hit a certain batch size, we basically flush our entity manager. In reality, in most imports, you probably don't want to use the entity manager. You maybe want to use the DBL, but um, just in case you, you want those relations and want to work with your entities, um, you, you still can, and it should be fine. And basically, the flush and clear is, is kind of our transaction thing that I mentioned before. We wouldn't be able to have this in here if we just read in a single item. Th this would move into uh, either be item per item flush, or we had to move it in, into um, the step. All right, so yeah, testable. Probably not that much, at least not unit testable, because we have the entity manager and the database and everything that we have to look out for. But we can basically replace it with any other writer if we want to write to Elasticsearch. And the code is simple enough that even this code we can modify um, if we just want to have some fancy stuff like valid, well, not probably validation, but um, we, we want to use um, some schema related things with the database, for example. And yeah, this is reusable because it, it just takes an entity manager, persists whatever entity. And uh, as long as I use Doctrine in my project, I can just reuse it. So this is kind of my baseline implementation. I have my three classes uh, for reading, writing, and processing. And I have the step class that pulls it all together. And if I then write my command using this, I kind of get this output. Uh, all those dots represent one batch that I basically sent via uh, the writer. So in my writer, I had some, some example output, so it's basically 250 items, and every 250 items you see a dot, and with 9.5 million lines, that means a lot of dots. And this is the, the final output that I collected with the Symphony stopwatch component. Um, it took one hour, three minutes. Considering it's nine and a half million lines, I think that's already pretty good, uh, but that's something we want to improve on. Um, what's pretty neat is the memory usage. So I stay at 12 MB memory usage, so those 9.5 million lines in one process um, never basically eat up all my memory because I use the transactions, I, I, I clear the, the items, for example, in my step every time so garbage collection can kick in. And my reader uses the generator so I don't read the whole file as one thing, which shows pretty nifty results. Obviously, it's not something you can easily pull in into your current project, but yeah, it, it works if you just set it up for new imports. And how can we improve this? How can we make it a, a better designed architecture. And now we move away from the code a little bit and, and look at, at the software architecture. So what we had before was we had some input, a large process that worked for a while, and then some output. And considering that our reader can basically read a, just a little bit of the file and, and can, can move it around at some point, what we can do is so-called partitioning. So we do the same step, but we do it at different positions, and um, we, use it, we, we do it basically in a parallel fashion. To be quite clear, partitioning in, in, in the JSR specification is way more advanced than what I will show you. It, it basically means we have some split and some join uh, capabilities to, to be able to, to get all the partitions back together um, at, at the very end. We won't need this in a simple scenario like this. Um, but this actually works because or, or the reason why, why I think it's, it's really nice is that I can use the code that we just saw and we just used and just put something on top of it and already make it considerably faster. And this is my partition manager that I use. Um, it in the beginning just looks at a process limit, like how many processes do I want to run in parallel at most. Um, I set it to five and then uh, once I hit that threshold, I just sleep for two seconds to, to wait for the processes to finish, check if one of those processes stopped, um, remove it from that process list, 
And then I, I check regularly if there's a process slot open, just open a new one. And I use the Symfony process component. I call the same command that, that I used before, just setting the amount and the offset, basically, which I previously didn't do. Um, and then I just start this process, put it into an array, and basically do it as for as long as I take. And after this while loop, I probably want to check if my last process is stopped as well. And then basically, but by just adding this partition manager, not changing any of the other code, um, what I get is this kind of output. Um, well, not changing any kind of code. I, I, I changed the output code that we see. This time, a dot does not represent 250 batches that, that are being sent to the database and being persisted. This time, one dot is a process being uh, started, basically. And the space is the, the sleep and, and waiting for the processes ba basically to, to finish so I can start a new one. And we can see in the very beginning, well, probably not because I zoomed in, but um, here you can see in the very beginning that I have my five processes that started. I waited for two seconds um, or maybe four seconds if it's two spaces. And then all those five processes actually finished already and it can start five new ones. Uh, but the longer the process runs, you can see that sometimes it's just one or two processes that finished. But Considering how often I, I, I have those five slots ready after a short waiting period, I could probably even improve it by running more processes, by, by shortening the sleep and even improve time there. But ju just with off the mill, just, just example f f uh, values that I set in there to, to check if it works, I already shaved the execution time in half, actually more than half. The memory limit is kind of cheated here because it only looks at my primary process and all the other processes will still use the 12, 12 and a half MB probably. But um, because I already know they are memory efficient, I'm fine with that. And yeah, so basically just by, with my poor man's partitioning, I can already improve the, the time for this by a lot. The downside is that basically I can't look into my processes that I started. Well, I could look at the output, for example, but um, if one of those processes fails, I will have a hard time basically figuring out sh how can I restart this and make sure that maybe this time it works, stuff like that. And the other downside is all those processes run on the same machine, basically. Um, I could do fancy SSH stuff to, to run the process on a different host, but probably wouldn't try that. Um, so we're still kind of limited here. It's nice, we, we improved by a lot, but probably we can do better. And this is basically the first time where Symfony kicks in, because the way I improve this setup is by using Symfony Messenger. So for those of you who don't know Messenger, it's a quite new component that was introduced in Symfony 4.1. Um, with the current release 4.3, there, there's a, a huge feature set in there that, that makes this even more usable for this use case. We will get to that later. And basically what this allows us is to send a message to a message bus or a message queue. Um, and um, then we can read those messages back from the queue and basically have the same thing with the partitioning where, where we can have worker processes reading those messages, but instead of me explicitly starting those processes, um, I, I just send out the messages and, and assume that someone else manages those processes for me, those, those workers. So how does this actually work in, in a kind of abstract fashion? Basically, my initial process will write a message, hey, I run read from this file, this many lines starting from this offset, so just the information we, we gave to our command during partitioning. Um, this is just a PHP class where I store this, this data in. Um, I send it to the messenger component via uh, message bus dispatch. The message bus will then figure out what should I do with this message. I basically configure my messenger to send it to RabbitMQ, for example. So it will see, ah, okay, I, I have a sender to send it away to the message queue. And then at some point I have a worker process that just reads from my queue, receives those messages, has to unserialize them, send them to its message bus. So it can basically figure out, okay, what kind of handler, what should I do with this thing? Obviously I don't want to just send it away. I, this time I actually want to process it. And basically what I get is two PHP processes, one for, for writing the message, one for reading the message. And 
They can be the, the same Symfony application or different applications. They can reside on the same server or on different servers as long as they can basically read or write to the queue. Um, and so basically, I not only have different processes, I can actually have different nodes to, to run them on and scale by, by basically starting up new machines just for processing, for example. And I can also write a different application for just reading th those files and actually doing my imports. So I can basically have my own import application if I want, which is kind of neat. So just to, to give you a better example of how this looks for partitioning, basically I have my initial program that, that I started to, to basically get, get the file count and then chunk it up to, to manageable builds. And this will just send a message to the queue. And then I, as developer or admin or whoever, are basically required to, to, write, uh, to, to start the consumers for, for those messages myself. Um, those consumers will then read from the queue and write it to a database. And as I said, I can start as many workers as I like. And this is then what a queue would look like if we use a doctrine as, as our queue. Um, Symphony Messenger out of the box supports three different async uh, queues. The, the def most common one, I think, is RabbitMQ. This is one that was supported at the very beginning. And then we have Doctrine, so we just can write to a database table. Um, this is something that I like for those kind of imports because I can easily read from this table and basically check if the job is running, if, if the message was delivered and stuff like that. So I basically check all the messages I sent in this time window, what's going on there, are they delivered, are, are they being processed. Um, which is harder to do with RabbitMQ. There's also the, the Redis um, queue that, that you could use. And just uh, if you're interested, this is basically from the, the RabbitMQ admin panel what it would look like. Um, I just send a bunch of messages in there. I, I don't know if you can read this. Um, right now I'm at 257 messages per second and you can see that at some point it was roughly 500 messages per second. So I, I can basically throw out those messages really, really fast from, from my main application. And I'm only held back by how many worker processes I start. So I'm not um, basically limited to the five things that, that, that I have uh, hardwired in, in my partition manager before. I can actually look at how much files I do I have to process, and then I scale them back or scale them up, which is really nice. So how do you start those consumers? Um, quite simply by basically just calling the bin console messenger consume command and then telling it uh, what kind of receivers do we have. Receivers basically is what kind of queue do I want to read from. So I can have different queues th th that I can read from, they are prioritized, and I'll just read those messages. And then I can tell this consumer process to only work on a certain limit of messages, memory limit, time limit. So basically using something like systemd, for example, I, I can um, restart my worker processes every now and then. So I can even use this mechanism if my reading processes are not memory optimized, like we saw before, if I have my old code, I, I can still write my worker and it works till a certain memory limit and then it will just gracefully restart, read the, the last message and I can start it again. So this is actually a neat way to, to even work with legacy imports without having to look too much into it to improve memory usage. All right, let's wrap this up. Where, where do we stand on our, our requirements? So when we look back at the initial code we wrote, this is still all the code that we need for in, in terms of processing. Um, we, we need some handlers for the messages and, and stuff like that. So, so some symphony specific code that I didn't show, but b because it's not something that's integral to, to my domain, I, I don't care that much about it. And it's actually quite simple code as well. But all the other stuff was testable with the exception of our writer. Most of the stuff, uh, pretty much all of the stuff was modifiable in the sense that because we have those interfaces, we can write new writers, readers, and processors. And we can also um, modify those classes that we already have because um, they are very small classes and, and very manageable. And we also said that most of the stuff is actually reusable. The, the flat file reader is usable, the writer is reusable. My, my step class for pulling it all together is reusable. It's basically the processors that are mostly um, application specific. So that's neat from the code perspective. 
And if we look at our architecture, we saw that just doing the poor man's partitioning, we could already improve um, the, uh, the speed of the import by a lot. And basically using the messenger, I, I don't have any comparison numbers because that, that would be really hard to, how do we measure it? I can start as many workers that I want and I would probably be able to, to get this done in like 10 minutes or something. And basically I'm limited by how fast I can read from that file and by how many workers I start and, and how fast I can scale them up. Um, so it's definitely fast. And it's memory efficient if, if we write those classes in that way. Um, and we already saw that using the messenger and, and being able to spawn new processes on, on new machines um, whenever we want, it's, it's also quite scalable actually. But this comes at a certain cost. Um, you probably have additional infrastructure needs when, when you write your imports that way. Um, the, the queue, for, for example, RabbitMQ, or if you use uh, the, the database for, for your queue, that then probably th that's not even the hardest hit that you get. I think the, the most complexity you get is from, from managing all those def different processes you have, where you probably want to have centralized logging and monitoring and stuff like that. You have to make uh, sure that you scale them down, otherwise you probably pay a lot of money for, for just having them idling around. So it's, it's not impossible to do it, but it's additional effort that you would have in, instead of just writing your plain old imports as you did before. It's harder to understand because you have lots of indirection through those messages. So if you start your initial process that starts the reading, you basically have no easy way to identify which processors will run in the end. It will take you a lot of digging it through, through the chain of what's happening in your logging, for example, to actually see what is happening, um, which I think for, for those imports is actually most of the time quite all right because they don't change as often. I, I will not add as many messages. Um, I'm less hesitant to do it there than I would be in my application code, for example, to, to go heavy on a message-based infrastructure. I, I would start slowly there, but with imports, it, it works okay. But it can be something that, that can be difficult, especially when onboarding new developers. Um, the biggest downside for me is the concurrency and the side effects. Obviously, if I have um, different processes that work on the same file or that uh, basically write to, to the same entity in my database, I can shoot myself in the foot quite easily. Um, and in the beginning, it's very likely that we'll, you will do. I, I know when we first started doing that in projects, we basically, the, the first one or two months was just debugging stuff and, and, and fixing issues we had, mostly from concurrency and side effects. We, we just didn't think about because in the beginning, we didn't have to. Again, it's, it's not something that's impossible or anything, but you should be aware that this will be an issue in the beginning and you should have a kind of failure culture where it's allowed to actually have this thing fail a few times and maybe you want to be more cautious in the beginning. And what, what I mentioned before, it, it's, it's kind of hard to retrofit, especially the first part into your existing code um, because usually the, the, the old code is quite entangled and, and, and you uh, can't really easily extract the writer, for example. Um, but since the, the um, import and, and batch process usually are quite isolated, those are things that I think are, are kind of okay to rewrite in most cases in, in, instead of just doing an easy migration. Um, or you can just start with a very simple process, uh, build up the, the kind of infrastructure in terms of writing the step and, and the basic classes that you want to reuse. And then it will be a little bit easier for the following um, more complex imports. But yeah, it's something to be aware of that it, it's a lot of work. And this is basically it for now. Um, th there's lots of things that we could actually discuss I hope you have questions. Otherwise, if you don't, then I will just go into more details on what kind of things you might think about for the message-based infrastructure like this and, and using the messenger imports. But yeah, shoot with questions if you have one. It doesn't look like there are any. OK, um, in that case, if, if you can think of something, just, just raise your hand. Um, in that case, I will just go. Um, 
and, and explain one downside that, that I basically di didn't even mention in the talk, um, that, that, that I just glossed over. When I use the messenger, I kind of have a fire and forget system. So I send my message to the queue and then m my parent process basically doesn't know what happens with this message. And especially with imports, this is usually not what I want to have. I want to have kind of, kind of reporting at the end, how many lines I process, how many stuff I inserted and, and stuff like that. So obviously that, that seems like a huge shortcoming. And there are a few ways around this. Um, to go back to the JSR specification, they actually have a huge part where they explain how you basically have logging around your jobs and your steps and steps ex step executions. And basically, um, you write to a database table, um, for this job, I started these steps and this is the current state. And I can use this separate logging table to, to basically um, figure out have my steps actually finished, is this job done? And I can do this uh, not just in my parent process. I obviously have to write this um, in when sending out my message, when receiving the message or when I'm finished handling the message. And then in the parent process, I can check back. Um, this is one easy way to, to get around this issue. Um, I, in some cases, I don't even have to do this. If I use Doctrine as my, my queue, then I can just look into that table. And in, in very simple scenarios, this might be enough for me. In other cases, this might be a little bit clumsy for me. And in that case, what I can do is basically once I've finished my step, I can also send out a message, hey, I finished this bit, and then I can collect those messages. Um, for example, in my, um, I, I have a, a separate listener that, that checks for those messages and knows how many messages it collects, and then it sends out its final message, all those steps finished. And I, I can still work around with my message architecture and send around messages to not just start a process and, or start a step, but all also to basically tell it that the step has stopped. And this allows me to even build more complex scenarios where, for example, um, I have one st uh, multiple steps that I work in parallel. And all, when all those processes and all those steps finish, then I start my next few steps that I can easily parallelize. Um, so it is doable, um, but Again, it adds to the complexity that you have. And, and so um, you, you might be cautious or, or you should be cautious in the beginning to, to not just send out messages all the time and, and maybe start with a simple logging approach. And again, JSR specification is quite useful to, to get uh, some ideas of what is useful information that I should log in there. And this is also a neat way to basically be able to, to restart. Again, questions around that? Okay, in this case, I, I will just do some k kind of advertising for the Symphony Messenger, where I think this, this is a neat way to, to approach it. And it's only two more minutes, then you can just leave, get popcorn. Um, so um, one cool thing that the Messenger added in Symphony 4.3 is uh, failure transports. So if you send out your message and at some point the processing fails, sure, you can look at your logging and, and your monitoring infrastructure to see if it failed, but that feels a little bit clumsy and, and, and um, might require you to do manual intervention. So instead, what you can do is you specify a failure transport, and as soon as the message processing fails, um, the Symphony Messenger will first retry it. There's a retry strategy by default, where it's um, three retries. It starts with one second delay and, and adds a two times multiplier. So it's one second, two seconds, four seconds um, to, to basically prevent dogpiling effects by, by just sending messages to a failing process. For example, if an API request fails um, because there's a downtime, you probably don't just want it to flood it with more messages until it works. And once those three retries are exhausted, it will put the message into that failure queue and that will just stay and will nof do nothing with it by default. But there are console commands where you can look at your failure queue, you can um, 
uh, show the message, basically see why did it fail, fix your code um, to, to basically be able to process that message, and then retry one message, for example. Or you can just remove the message from the failure queue if you say, like, yeah, I don't, I don't really care, uh, th this can fail. So that's one neat thing where you don't have to write any lines of code. You basically add to your configuration, I want to use this queue as my failure transport, and Symfony will just send those messages there and, and basically do everything for you, which is really neat. And th that, that can help you with basically managing failure states in your import processes quite a lot. Um, another good thing is that you can actually, if, if you don't want to use RabbitMQ or Doctrine or Redis as your transports, you can also use other transports. So for example, if you have NQ as, as a queuing library in your project, which is really cool, but very complex to set up. But if you already have done that, then yeah, sure enough, just reuse it. And you can basically have an adapter that uses those queues. And with that, you can use Amazon SQS, Kafka, or whatever. So, so you have way more options to, to basically um, access and queues adapters and, and without actually having to write the heavy lifting, low level stuff that you would usually have to do with NQ, where you easily run into errors because you are responsible for rejecting and acknowledging the messages. The Symphony Messenger just takes care of it for you, which makes it very easy to get started. And still, it's easy to basically shift stuff to NQ if you need more advanced and more low level functionality. So yeah, give it a try if you are on Symphony 4, especially if you move to the Symphony 4.4 LTS that will come out end of November. And with that, again, thank you. If you have any specific questions you want to ask, you probably can find me around today. And thank you for listening.